Hello there. Welcome to our uh, upload on the uh, sharing of the conflict of laws. This time it's a short uh, portion that was cut off from the first release. We are handling this uh, in order to cover two topics that were not included in the first run, which is uh, the domiciliary theory and the Renvoa doctrine. This will not take very long. This may be one of the shorter ones, and this should have been included in the first run. I am Dean Joe Santos Balagtas Biscara, University of Manila. I have a Bachelor of Business Administration, major in accounting, and a certified public accountant. University of the East, summa cum laude. I have my Master of Business Administration, MBA, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Magna Cum Laude, Valedictorian. My Bachelor of Laws is from the University of the East, Cum Laude, and Valedictorian. After I finished my undergraduate course and have taken the CPA board exam, I joined the corporate world and gradually rose up to the higher levels of senior corporate management in the field of finance. I joined uh, the big companies I've been with, multinationals of that, are Fuji Xerox, Motorola Philippines, ESO, Petron. I was also with Glaxo SmithKline, and I was the controller of Eco Asia, the construction division of Meralco that handled the uh, electromechanical component of the Bataan nuclear power plant. I worked with FMC for Furadan and I was a World Bank consultant uh, for two projects in the water system and the fisheries sector. After I uh, passed the bar examination, even when I was full-time uh, in the corporate world, I decided to appear as practicing lawyer and counsel in several uh, cases in the trial courts all over Metro Manila and the surrounding provinces, including labor cases before the arbiters and the, La and the National Labor Relations Commission. I was nominated twice as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. I am professorial lecturer in Criminal Law and Mercantile Law of the Philippine Judicial Academy, the Supreme Court training arm. As I was saying, I am the Dean of the College of Law, University of Manila, the incumbent Vice President for Legal Affairs and a member of the Board of Trustees. At one time, I was also Law Dean and Vice President for Legal Affairs of both uh, the Las Piñas and the uh, Binyan groups of the University of Perpetual Health. For 35 long years, I was an MBA professor in financial management at the De La Salle Graduate School of Business and at one time also at the University of the Philippines in Diliman and the University of the East. One time or the other, I, I was bar reviewer and law professor at the University of the East, University of Santo Tomas, De La Salle University, University of Perpetual Health, San Sebastian College, and Far Eastern University. This particular series of lectures on uh, uh, conflict of laws, with your permission, I are fond memories of my beloved Dean and Professor, Dean Celedonio Chengson. I dedicate these two uh, uploads on conflict of laws and this time the Renvoa Doctrine in his honor, even when I failed to see him when I heard he already passed away. Don't also forget uh, this little reminder to you, you don't click this. There is a little uh, button there on your screen on the lower uh, upper lower right hand corner when you may wish to click because they said if I reach 1000 uh, subscribers they would probably have a little uh, stipend for me meaning YouTube 
that will allow me to buy probably some show pao or hopia along the way. That is not really my purpose in uploading these slides. This is our way of putting our online law system at the UM College of Law and at the same time attract any layman to learn something from us without making it look bakyang bakya. Just to take a second look at what we took at in the first slide so as to link up the concepts. First, this entire uh, two uh, series of up uploads cover the nature and composition of conflict rules. Second, it uh, covers the Philippines conflict of laws uh, listing The nationality theory is covered extensively. The impact of the Philippine nationality theory on the exercises involving citizenship, status, capacity, paternity, and filiation. The interface of conflict of laws with marriage and divorce. The issues involving real and personal taxes as it interfaces with conflict of laws. Conflict of laws and as it affects wills and succession. And the second upload will cover the counterpart of the nationality theory. We will discuss the domiciliary theory. And finally, we close this sharing with the most exciting topic in conflict of laws, the problem of the rainbow. Just to, to link up with the first series of slides, let us revisit what is the concept and nature of conflict of laws. When we speak about conflict of laws, we're not talking about uh, laws that are quarreling. On the other hand, it is really the synchronization of laws between one country to another when the citizen or subject of another country may be facing a court proceedings before Philippine courts. And so in this scenario, Philippine courts now are guided by what are called the state's municipal or domestic law that directs its courts and administrative agencies on how to apply or not to apply a foreign law in resolving a legal problem involving a foreign element. So this set of laws, in our case, we have summarized that as five. That would be Article 15, 16, 17, and the doctrine on Lex Losai uh, Celebrationis and Lex Situs would comprise the Philippine set of conflict of laws. They are our domestic laws that allow our courts to understand when can they use the foreign law in order to address a legal issue that is confronting them in their sala. Another way of looking at conflict of laws is that it is a collection of domestic laws that directs the courts and administrative agencies to adopt a foreign law in resolving a legal problem with a foreign component. The elements, therefore, of conflict of laws would be, one, the state has a municipal law concerning the use of foreign law in domestic cases with a foreign element. And we have that. We have our Articles 15, 16, and 17 in the Civil Code that strongly adheres to the concept of nationality theory as it is applied to the conflict of laws. The second element of conflict of laws is that the said laws direct the courts and administrative agencies on when to use foreign law. The third one is that the legal problem at hand involving, of course, a, uh, a foreigner uh, or a foreign place 
which involves a foreign element. And number four, either foreign law or Philippine domestic law is available to resolve the legal problem. And so there is always a choice. And that is the reason why we need a certain set of laws which we have now collectively called the conflict of laws that would guide our courts on whether or not to bring in foreign law in order to accommodate an alien or foreigner that is before the said courts. Going directly now to the coverage of the second upload. The domiciliary theory is the counterpart theory of the nationality theory. And the domiciliary theory says that it is a concept in conflict of laws where the status, condition, rights, obligations, and capacity of an individual is governed by the law of his domicile. In other words, in the nat uh, nationality theory, the status, condition, rights, obligation, and capacity of a person is determined in his capacity as a citizen of a country. Whereas in the case of domiciliary theory, such status, condition, rights, obligations, and capacity are determined by the law where he lives or he decides. And so domicile here would represent a person's permanent place of abode or residence or it is that place where a person has settled for a fixed and legal relations. And so therefore, if we compare domicile with citizenship or nationality, citizenship refers to the ties of allegiance of an individual with his country, his act of loyalty to his country. Let us now go to what are the kinds of domiciles. There are three kinds. The first one of these domiciles is what is called this domicile of origin. The second one is the constructive domicile. And the third one is what is called the domicile of choice. When we take a look at the characteristics that distinguishes one from the other, we will take a look on a collective uh, uh, chart here, arranged in a columnar manner, so that we can compare one after the other what is the domicile of origin, what is the constructive domicile, and what is the domicile of choice. So starting with the domicile of origin, the domicile of origin is acquired by birth. It is that place where an individual was born. That is his domicile of origin. And second, this domicile of origin are really very obvious in the case of infants because the infants would have no choice except to take a look and claim the domicile of, the domicile of origin is where they were born. On the constructive domicile, this would represent the domicile or place of residence given after birth. And so here, the infant may not have had all the, the, the authority, power, and capacity to move to one place. But his parents or his benefactors or guardians may have transferred him from the place of birth to another place of uh, residence. Uh, this reminds me of uh, the situation of uh, Jesus Christ with the uh, Blessed Mother and also Saint Joseph, where he was born in Jerusalem, but he is not supposed to be there. You know, he so his domicile of origin is Jerusalem, but ultimately he settled in. Nazareth. That's why he's called a Nazorean. So his constructive domicile of Nazareth was given after birth because if you remember, 
the angel told uh, Saint Joseph to move to Egypt because of uh, the fear of Herod on December 28, killing all the babies, hoping that the born Messiah will be killed. And so Joseph brought Mary and Jesus to Egypt. And when it was safe, he did not anymore go back to uh, Jerusalem, but he went to his uh, normal place of residence, which is Nazareth. And so Jesus, uh, uh, domicile of origin is Jerusalem, and Jesus' constructive domicile is Nazareth. And the constructive domicile represents those who lack the capacity to choose their own domicile because they are still dependents and so that therefore the constructive domicile is normally handed to them by way of their parents or guardians bringing them to their own uh, preferred place of residence. So finally the individual has his own uh, option and so his domicile of choice is decided by his voluntary will and action. So this is the nature of domiciles under the concept of domiciliary theory. We now finally uh, end up with the finale of Conflict of Laws, the very famous Renboa Doctrine. The Renboa Doctrine is literally uh, referring to or is called the referring to uh, praise. So when you say Renvoa, you mean referring back. The Renvoa Doctrine is a legal phenomenon in private international law where the conflicts law of two countries interface to create a legal ping pong stalemate on which law shall prevail. Let's again uh, assemble our thoughts on how conflict of laws gets into the legal process. Let's say you have now a court here in the Philippines and uh, among the cases presented to it is a case involving a foreigner, whether he is a defendant or he is the uh, he's the complainant, or let us take for example, he he is dead, and it is therefore his estate that is the subject matter of succession proceedings. And so therefore, his heirs, you know, the representatives of his estate, come to us as a probate court, and asks us. How do we partition the properties that he has left behind for us? So the Renvo Dacrin now comes into view because it is the, 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 the estate of a deceased foreigner who is involved. And therefore, we bring in now Articles 15, 16, 17, the Lex Rosae Celebrationis and Lex Situs, in order to assemble the five laws that comprise the Philippine conflicts laws that will guide us on whether we will use a foreign uh, law. And so looking into our uh, Article 16, we learn that the Philippines adheres to the nationality theory, where the nationality theory says that when you decide cases, especially involving succession or the status or civil status or condition of a person, you use the law of the country where this subject is a national. In other words, you use the law of the country where this person is a citizen. That is what our conflicts rule is telling us. And as we looked at uh, our conflicts rule and we are asked to use the law of the country of the subject uh, of our case, we look at the estate of the deceased person and the deceased person happens to be a Swiss citizen. He comes from Switzerland. And so 
our reaction would be based on our uh, national uh, national uh, uh, theory. We are to use the law of the nation of the nation of that particular deceased person, which is the law of Switzerland. And so we now looked at our conflicts law and compare it with the conflicts law, the equivalent of our Article 16 in Switzerland. And so you have now two conflicts laws, one from the Philippines and one from Switzerland. One is saying that you should use the law now, under our Philippine law, it is saying to us, to the judge, that you should use the law of the country where this foreigner is coming from. And so, you now, uh, in effect, uh, borrow, make reference to the law, to the conflicts law of Switzerland, and ask yourselves, does the law of Switzerland tell us what law to use for this decedent? And so it is possible that the law, the, the conflicts law of the Philippines adopts the uh, theory of uh, nationalization. Okay. While on the other hand, the law of Switzerland can also be using the, the uh, nationality theory. And so both laws are saying you use the law of the nation where this particular foreigner is coming from. So Philippine law says you use the law of Switzerland and Switzerland is also saying you use our law because he is our citizen. So in that particular case, if we are the forum that is processing this, we now tell the Swiss uh, authorities, since we will be using Switzerland law, may we borrow your Switzerland law on succession so that we will now adopt that law as if it were Philippine law where our court will now use that to resolve the succession issue for your citizen. Now, that is not really complicated because the two conflicts laws use the uh, nationalization doctrine. However, it is possible that the Philippines uses the natural uh, nationalization doctrine or national doctrine and Switzerland does not use that doctrine. Switzerland, for example, uses the doctrine or, or the domiciliary doctrine that we have just discussed. So there now is a legal ping pong where our uh, law is telling us to use Switzerland uh, conflicts law. And Switzerland conflicts law is in effect telling us do not use our conflicts law so that you can use our domestic law because our conflicts law is saying you use the law of the domicile where our citizen comes from. And since he lives in the Philippines, you are not to use the law of Switzerland on succession, but you need to use now the law on succession in the Philippines, his place of domicile. Then you have actually an initial legal ping pong because our, our uh, uh, conflict law is saying use the law of Switzerland and the law of Switzerland is saying use the law of the Philippines because this, this one uses the nationalization theory and is using the demosiliary theory. If that is the situation, because the Philippines adheres to the nationality theory, I, I'd like to correct myself, it is not nationalization but nationality theory under Article 16, its conflicts law Philippine conflicts law must refer to the dead man's uh, dead alien's conflicts law on succession. And that's why we were mentioning that if he were a citizen of Switzerland, we will have to borrow, you know, uh, the law of the conflicts law of Switzerland. So we will conform with our nationality theory 
in our conflicts law. However, the aliens' conflicts law may prescribe that his successional rights be resolved by the law of the country where he was domiciled upon death. In effect, Swiss law may be saying, do not use our law. Why? Because that is what our law, our conflict law says. That when you have a Swiss citizen who dies in your country and you, do, you need to decide on his successional rights, you use the law of the domicile where he passed away or he died. And so he died in the Philippines, then you use Philippine law. And so Philippine law, uh, the, the court would say, we are being told by our law to use Swiss law. And Swiss law is telling us that they are, uh, their law is saying that we use Philippine law. That's why there is a legal ping pong stalemate. Hence, Philippine domestic law on succession, the family code, may be the law to be used or to be resorted to in resolving the alien succession that is being processed before a Philippine court. The Renvoir referring back started when the Philippine conflicts law adhering to the nationality theory had to make the first referral to the aliens conflicts law on the issue of succession. In turn, the Aliens Conflicts Law, which is the counterpart of our Article 16. They will also have their Article 16 under uh, the law on Switzerland. May be founded on the domiciliary theory and therefore invokes Philippine domestic law, the family code, as the second referral, yun yung binabalik to resolve the issue of succession. If you were to put that in a diagram, here is the Philippines and here is that uh, so-called Swiss citizen who died in the Philippines uh, because of this COVID-19. There he is now. He is being willed to the crematorium. But on top of his whole life is essentially uh, properties that he owned, buildings in the Makati area. And so Philippine uh, conflicts law which follows the nationality theory, says you partition his property, Mr. Switzerland, on the basis of uh, the conflicts law of Switzerland because that is what Philippine conflicts law under Article 16 is saying. So Switzerland now takes a look at itself and says, what does our conflicts law, our Article 16 is telling us? And when they read their Article 16, their Article 16 says that the succession of Swiss citizens will follow the law of the place of domicile where he passed away. And so now reading that, the Swiss authorities say, Mr. Philippine Court, please allocate the properties of our Swiss citizen using Philippine domestic law. And so this is the situation that can happen in the so-called Renvoa dilemma. And so the probate Philippine court now has the option to resolve the Renvoa dilemma. The Philippine court is confronted with a civil issue involving an alien or a foreign element. Second, because the Philippine Conflicts Law, Article 16, adheres to the nationality theory, it has to pass on the resolution of such succession issue involving a Swiss citizen to his country, in our example, Switzerland. When the Aliens Conflicts Law adheres to the domiciliary theory, in this particular example, Switzerland's law, for example, follows the domiciliary theory, then it would in effect tell itself that the only way by which he can uh, resolve the succession issue of his uh, Swiss citizen in the Philippines is to follow his law which says that follow the law on succession in the, in the country where he was domiciled at the time he was 
uh, he died, and that is the Philippines. And so therefore, the Philippine probate court here may reject the Renboa. He says, I do not like you to order me to, uh, to handle the succession issue before me using our Swiss law. Or you want to return it to me so that I will have to use my Philippine domestic law. I do not want to follow you. I am also a sovereign state. So I will reject your order for me to use my domestic law and I will borrow your domestic law on succession and use it in order to resolve the succession issue of your citizen. The second option is I do not like to be involved. The Philippine court can decide. It will not take the position that under the theory of desistance or the mutual disclaimer of jurisdiction, the Philippine court can claim that the aliens' conflicts law, which adheres to the domiciliary theory, is inadequate to demand the application of Philippine domestic law. In effect, if you want to be very pragmatic about it, the Philippine court can say, who are you? If I, you are ordering me as a sovereign country, you know, to resolve this using my own law, I do not want to give you that kind of authority to exercise over me. I would simply invoke my theory of desistance, meaning I do not want to do anything, or the mutual disclaimer of jurisdiction, I do not want to assume jurisdiction. Or the third doctrine is I invoke the doctrine of forum non-convenience, where for me as a Philippine court, to even be involved with the successional issue of this foreigner is too much for me to do. I have other things to worry about. In these two options, the Philippine court, in effect, is rejecting the Renboa. It is rejecting the returning back or referring back. However, the next two options can take the opposite uh, course of action, where the Philippine court can accept the Renboa. Okay, I will uh, accept your order, and I will now therefore use my Philippine domestic law to distribute the properties of your deceased Swiss citizen. The fourth one is, I do not like to use my own Philippine judicial system, including my Philippine domestic law. Why don't I just, you know, imagine sitting in your shoes as the Swiss court, a foreign court, under the foreign court theory, and do whatever you're supposed to do as if I were a Swiss court, even if I were a Philippine court, which means I will now be using both your conflicts law and your domestic law in order to distribute the properties of your uh, Swiss citizen. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the essence of the Renboa Doctrine, and this is the kind of judicial legal ping-pong that can happen when two countries, for example, dealing with the successional right or succession of a dead alien whose probate is presented before a Philippine court is handled when the conflicts law of the Philippines using the nationality theory is not the same as the conflicts uh, uh, law of the country of that alien which follows the domiciliary theory because there will be this kind of referring back Pabalik balik. And it therefore finally leaves the discretion to the Philippine court following the four alternatives we have given. I'd like to uh, again take uh, a little of your indulgence and favor for me to spend a little uh, few comments and little few views as I uh, dedicate these two uploads on YouTube on conflict of laws for the memory of my dear friend 
and my dear superior, Dean Celedonio Chongson. First of all, I learned conflicts of law, this one that I am lecturing from Dean Chongson. I will not be surprised that over the years, I must have uh, transferred my notes from him, from his lectures, into what are now contained in these slides, a substantial portion, even when I did some little research in order to further beef up the material. But I'd like to remember and thank Dean Celedonio Chongson for having been part of my uh, life, of my entire being as a lawyer. Who is Dean Chongson for those of you who have not heard of him? Dean Celedonio Chongson was the Dean of the College of Law of the University of the East from 1987 to 1989. It was in 1987 I decided to come back to school to finally take up my law. And I went to UE aware that I cannot go to UP because of the distance and aware that Ateneo, even when I passed the entrance examination, did not want to accept uh, working students in 1987. And so my option of going to the university belt gave me a very limited choice of coming back to the University of the East, my alma mater, for my business administration degree. And so at that particular time, Dean Chongson was the acknowledged authority, the bar reviewer par excellence and the law professor of public international law and conflict of laws, precisely the subject matter we are talking about. And he was my professor, I'd like to correct the slide, not in political law, but political science too. And political science too covered the Bill of Rights of the 1935 Constitution. That was in 1965, and I was 16 years old when I learned from Dean Chongson what is due process of law, what is equal protection clause, what is warrant of arrest and uh, uh, warrantless arrest, what are the rights of an accused, and all of these concepts under the Bill of Rights of the 1935 Constitution. So the fundamentals of law I learned from Dean Chongson. After a long, long time when he came back to, to, to study law, I finally ended up taking a public international law and conflict of laws at UE Law on my final year of 1991-1992. And that was when Dean Chong Son again became my professor. My fond memories of Dean Chong Son would be highlighted by the following little notes. First, my own mother, Dr. Natividad Balagtas Biscera, went back to school to finish her Bachelor of Science in Education at UE, and Professor Chongson was also her professor in Political Science too. in 1957 when I was 10 years old, and she would fondly remember her grade of flat one under Dean Chongson. And there was therefore a time when I went back to take up my business administration in 1964 at UE. And on my freshman year, I have political science too. And the professor that was assigned to me is somebody I felt I needed to, to, to look up to another professor. I want to change my professor. I was not impressed and so I told my mother and my mother again proudly remembered her flat one with Dean, uh, Professor Chongson 
And so we came to see Professor Chongso to ask his permission for me to become a transferee to his class. And he told my mother, Nati, if your son is as good as you for a grade of flat one, then he is welcome to my class. And so it came to pass that uh, I was under Professor Chongson. And when the final exams came, my mother and Professor Chongson again bump into each other in the campus. And my mother asked the question, Professor Chongson, how is my son? Professor Chongson said, your son also got a flat one like you. The only difference is you got a flat one as your final grade. Your son had a flat one on the preliminary grade. He got a flat one on the midterm grade and he got a flat one in the final grade. It was a straight flat one. So perhaps uh, your finished product appears to have been an improvement of yourself, Nati. And both of them laughed. And I knew that was not complimentary to my mother, who always thought that I should, he, she, she should be always ahead of me in the field of academics. So when I went back to UE in 1987 to finally enroll in the College of Law, and I saw, I visited Dean Chongson in the office of the Dean. He immediately asked me to accept a teaching load in the College of Law because he knew I was teaching at the Graduate School of UE. And he said, how come you never saw me to teach in the College of Law? So he said, you're a CPA. I'd like you to handle taxation and mercantile law. And can you start this Saturday? I really felt so complimented, but I could not tell him uh, my dilemma. So I finally said, Sir, I would accept the teaching load, but can you just allow me first to finish my Bachelor of Laws? And he was really so surprised. He looked at me and said, What? You are not yet a lawyer? So why are you here? And I said, Precisely to become a lawyer, sir, to study. And how old are you? I'm 40 years old now, sir. And you think you can still handle studying law when you're now 40 years old? I am not really sure, so you better take the entrance exam. And said, uh, Dean, uh, I, I, of course I could not say I was one of your outstanding students here in the entire campus when I was here. But I, I finally brought out my acceptance uh, card at the Ateneo Law School and said, Sir, would I still have to take the entrance exam here when I already passed the entrance exam at Ateneo? And said, why are you not in Ateneo? Said, they do not want to accept working students. So he finally said, oh, sige, sige. You better just enroll with my uh, little signature here. And so I finally came to be a law student under Dean Chongson. Unfortunately for me, Dean Chongson expressed among some of his friends about his concern that I may not survive law school when I was already 40 years old until he saw me in the recitation precisely on this subject, conflict of laws. The only comment he made was, Joe, mukaya tang pwede ka pa, tutuloy ba tayo sa bar exam? And I said, sir, I have been here for five years. Every semester, you've been asking me kung nandito pa ako. Gagraduate na po ako, sir. Buhay pa ho, lalaban at tuloy-tuloy sa bar examination. And he smiled. Dean Chongson must have secretly prayed that I top the 1993 bar exams. After all the years when he introduced me to law in 1965, he would have been the proudest lawyer 
the proudest professor and the proudest lodin that was uh, who was my friend well i would still meet him in the campus but the more intimate meetings was right here at the um college of law it was an ego trip for me to be among the um bar reviewers one time starting to take the 1994 list of bar reviewers here and my name was side by side with my idol Dean Celedonio Chongson. Dean Chongson, sorry for not being able to say goodbye to you when you have to uh, live uh, this life. You must have led a good life and perhaps my trying to expound on your expertise in conflict of laws is my way of giving you tribute by giving you my thanks my, my thanks and appreciation for what you have done to make me a good lawyer of course you saw me as a bar reviewer and that must have already been an ego trip likewise for you a former student of yours now discussing the law as a bar reviewer, as an expert. Of course, you did not anymore see me when I equally became the dean in 2004 and 2009 in two schools. And when you finally, when I finally was nominated to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court in 2012 and 2016. However, I'm sure you, wherever you are, you must be too happy but I remember you whenever conflict of laws comes to my mind. Thank you very much, Dean, for being part of my life and being part of my having become a good lawyer like you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to close this particular second wave of the lecture on conflict of laws elevated up to uh, as an upload to YouTube and this is part of our online conduct of our UM bar review and our regular classes under this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you continue to watch this particular uh, uh, slides and I wish that you can keep on repeating in order to master the principles that we try to share with you and take note of this little note please subscribe there is a little button here that you may click for every uh, set of slides that i upload they say that there is a little consolation financial consolation when my subscription were to reach 1000 subscription in a span of i started august 13 the latest registration is 563 so i'm barely close to 400 and i am sure with your help i can make it of course this is my 12th uh, slide and perhaps the only dean of the college of law in the whole philippines that has so far taken too much effort with assembling his knowledge of the law putting it in powerpoint slides and uploading it in youtube Marami pong salamat. I continue to pray for you. Mahal ko po kayong lahat just because you're patient enough to watch these slides. Thank you very much.